So, um, I'll tell you who I am first. Uh, so I'm Dan, as has been mentioned. Um, I've spent the last two years studying electronics at the University of York. Uh, decided that was a bad idea, so I've sort of stopped that. Uh, <laughs> taking a year out. Uh, when I go back, I'll be doing computer science, hopefully. Uh, but for now, I'm working at ARM, so at least they trust me to know what I'm talking about when it comes to this. Um, so, why would anyone want to build <laughs> such a trivially small... Oh, no, first of all, sorry. I'm claiming that this is the world's smallest, uh, well, lowest spec PC. And so just in case you didn't believe me, um, these three comparisons at the top here are sort of FPGA utilization numbers. So the RAM in this computer, which is only 64 bits, um, actually takes up only a third of the space in the FPGA that I need for one of the switch debouncers, which tells you two things, I guess. One, I've got not a lot of RAM, and two, the switches are really bouncy. Um, but the entire implementation in the FPGA only takes off about the size of two and a half of the debouncers. So it, it's overall, it's pretty small as well. And I've sort of tried to compare it to an ARM Cortex-M0+, Plus, which is the smallest ARM microcontroller that you can get. Um, these numbers might be a bit iffy because I'm comparing FPGA utilization to gate count, which is a bad idea. But I reckon it's you know, at least smaller than a third of ARM's smallest core, so it's pretty small. Um, and that led to a bit of a silly comparison. If you had an HDTV and that represented the CPU, CPU in your iPhone 5S, um, it's got about 2 million pixels on an HDTV this thing would take up nine of them on the same TV. <laughs> so it's pretty small. And I've also compared it to the size of the RAM on the world's first stored program computer. And as you can see, it's tiny. <laughs> so that was the SSEM, which had 1,024 bits of RAM. So it's a fairly small core. Why would anybody want to build a computer so small? So when I got my first computer, this is the sort of thing that I saw. There was a big black box in the middle, and it did some magic stuff. And I had no idea what was going on inside it. And that was really annoying. Um, I think I had the keyboard and mouse the right way around when I used it. But <laughs> I, I didn't know what was going on in there, and that, that really annoyed me. So shortly after I got that computer, um, my dad installed QBasic on it for me. It was a Windows 95 machine. And I started learning to write BASIC. And so this picture grew in my mind of what was going on inside. Um, this was when I was about eight or nine or something. And so I kept learning how to program it in various other languages and eventually assembly language. And so I thought, yeah, I figured out how it works now. By the time I was about 15. <laughs> So this was the image that I had in my head. I thought, yeah, I reckon I know how a, how a computer works now. I'm not going to explain that in detail, but <laughs> that's a sort of generic <coughs> a CPU might look like this. So I said to myself, I think I know how these things work now. <laughs> I reckon I could make my own. Um, I said could make my own, though. So back when I was 15, my pocket money wouldn't cover a computer that I would know how to build at the time. So I was thinking of, you know, I'd need a mountain of 74 series logic chips or transistors or relays or something. So I kind of gave up on the idea. But then a few years later, uh, when I got to university, started studying electronics, I did a VHDL course. So that was teaching how to use VHDL to program FPGAs. And so suddenly I knew how to build a computer and I had the resources to do it because I could just go and buy an FPGA and program that. I didn't need a mountain of hardware. So I drew this diagram. <laughs> um, I'm not going to explain that in detail either. I've also made the mistake of putting an architecture diagram in my slides. So <laughs> um, yeah, I, I came up with this idea for 
just a really simple CPU that I could design just to prove to myself that I do actually know how a computer works. So this was inspired by this, which I've already mentioned. This is the SSEM, uh, more commonly known as the Manchester Baby. So this is a, a replica which is in the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester of the, the world's first <laughs> computer, effectively. Uh, but it had this really cool little thing in the middle here. This, this is a CRT, which displays a grid of dots and dashes, and that represents the entire memory of the system. So you can see your program loaded in on that screen. And in fact, there's another CRT somewhere over on this side, which is actually the storage for the program. So there's a, there's a grid of sensors in front of a CRT, and it's sort of like a delay line memory. It scans the entire memory out to the, the phosphor on the front of the screen and then that's detected and sent back round. So it's a sort of primitive delay line memory. Well, I thought that was a really cool idea. So you'll see right in the middle of my design there's this grid here, 8 by 8 grid of LEDs, which is going to represent my entire RAM. So, oops. So I went and bought this, which is a Papilio 1500K board, I think. Um, and one of those, which is like two quid off of eBay. Uh, that was the pretty much the reason for making the, the memory size 8x8, was because I could get a super cheap module that already did it, and I knew how to use it, and I could easily connect it to my FPGA. So I wrote some DHL code, and to my surprise, it worked. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so there it is. Thanks, bye. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is actually, um, this is version two. I hope you don't think I'm lying to you, but th th this is not the original. Uh, somebody broke the original one. <laughs> so I, I took this to uh, the UK Maker Fair in Newcastle. And York Hackspace was unfortunate enough to be placed in an area where the floor that you were walk walking on sort of built up a static charge in you as you walk across it. And back, back when I had version one, the Papilio was actually mounted to the back of the lid on that screw there. And so a fellow York Hackspace member was walking along the floor and then came over to this and said, oh, look at this cool thing touched that and completely killed it, <laughs> <laughs> which was a, a bit annoying, but <laughs> it, it <laughs> 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 yeah, it, it actually, um, Bob actually killed the, the Papilio board. I don't know exactly what he did to it, but I had to get a new one anyway. Um, so yeah, that, that's version two. That prompted the addition of some extra features. So you know, I should thank him really. <laughs> and of course, it's open source. You can go and download this, buy a Papilio, buy a two quid LED matrix off of eBay, and make your own one of these if you if you wish. And also, uh, another member of your cat space got quite interested in this project. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So Nick Moriarty wrote in JavaScript uh, an emulator for this machine. And then I wrote a front end for it, which is why it doesn't look very good. But if you want to, you can go and play around with the architecture, write some programs um, all inside your browser. Now, <laughs> the controversial slide. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is how I see FPGA programming for hobbyists. Um, I, I'm not the next Randall Munro, it's, it's clear, but... <laughs> well, well, I look at things like um, Arduino and Raspberry Pi and all of the similar things around that. Um, you see great communities of people who know what they're talking about, mostly, and are willing to welcome you in, give you advice. Um, but unfortunately, for hobbyists at least, there isn't 
at least from my point of view. I, I don't see quite the same um, community, uh, which annoys me a bit. Uh, th this is changing. So the, the Papilio is great. It's not super cheap, but it's also really difficult to find good resources on the internet that tell you how to program it. And so that was what put me off initially. And so it was when I did the VHDL course at uni that I decided to buy one and try to learn how to use it. So, rant over. So you only have eight bytes of memory and you need to store your entire program in that and the data that it uses. So, can be a bit of a challenge. So, um, there's a couple of programs there. So, the first program that I wrote was effectively just a counter that counted from one to six and then looped back round. And so, depending on how long you ran the program, it would generate a random number between one and six, hence it's a die roll program. Uh, it would just store the result in the last three bits of the last line in the RAM there. Um, but it's a really simple architecture. There's about 30 instructions, and each one is a five-bit opcode and a three-bit address, which obviously points to one of these other um, locations in memory. So it's, it's quite easy. I won't go in, in depth much into these programs, but you, you can go and have a play with it in the simulator if you want to learn exactly how they work. But yeah, you have to play a game called Extreme Code Golf when you're programming this. <laughs> so I was chatting to some friends from York Hackspace, and I said, um, I don't think you can fit a Cylon program in eight bytes. <laughs> and they mostly agreed. Um, so a Cylon program is a, a well, a, a Cylon is a monster with a scanning LED animation on it, just in case you don't know. <laughs> um, so I thought it'd be a challenge to get one of these lines to do a sort of scrolling backwards and forwards animation. And it is quite difficult, but fortunately, I've got it here, the machine does have a mode where you can view the one and only internal register that it's got which does make it a little bit easier, so you just have to make the value in the register do the animation that you want. Um, but still, it's difficult to fit it into eight bytes. And so this is a program that Nick wrote, actually, which proves you can do it in eight bytes. But there's some nasty tricks played. So you'll notice jump one is the first instruction, which is just going to jump from there to there, which would have happened anyway. So that's a no-op. And load one, by that point in the program, at least after the first iteration, is also a no-op. And you have to do that because each loop that moves the LED from one side to the other takes up three bytes. And each test needs one byte of data to check to see if it's hit the end. So that's already eight bytes, and you haven't got any space to put an instruction in to jump back to the start of the first loop. So your data gets executed as if it's instructions, which means it has to be no op equivalent, which is a bit annoying as well. There's also, so here's another example of some more extreme code golf. <laughs> so I thought, that's pretty cool, but I want this to interface with the real world. So there is a GPIO connector on the side here. Uh, so I thought, can I get the same thing to happen on a bunch of LEDs on a breadboard? And you kind of can, but it's a bit awkward. So when you do this, the LED doesn't move at the same speed. So it'll go that way really quickly and then move really slowly that way. Because one of the operations that makes it shift has to be implemented outside of the machine <laughs> because uh, well, you need an extra instruction in each loop to write the value out to the GPIO port. But they're already taking up three instructions each. So if each one needed an extra instruction in it, then you'd have no space for your extra data. Um, and so in this case, I've used this IO swap instruction, which writes a value out and reads a value in at the same time. And so the other rotation is actually implemented by a bunch of wires connecting the outputs to the inputs, <laughs> but shifted, <laughs> which is a bit of a cheat, I know. And it does mean it takes two iterations through that loop to actually do the shift, so that's why it's a bit slower. Um, but yeah, so challenges involved in 
programming it, but it can be fun. I like code golf. Uh, so some people have said to me, oh, that'd be really great for teaching computer science. And they're probably right. So if you start teaching someone how to program a computer from a really high level, then they'll probably understand it after a while. But like with me, it took me you know, seven or eight years to figure out exactly what was going on underneath. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's people at Intel who couldn't even tell you. <laughs> there's, there's probably one or two engineers at Intel that know exactly what's going on in there, if that, I reckon. But you know, with something, something like this, which is you know, a lot more tangible and easier to understand, you could explain all the concepts to someone fairly quickly and they'll be able to understand it even if they've never really seen um, such a thing before, which I think could be a really useful tool. Um, I've actually made that take a lot less time than I thought it would, so that's the end. Thank you very much.